this webinar is sponsored by four groups. So before we get to the main presentation, I wanted to let you know a little bit more about these groups and the resources they offer. Yard Smart Marin, which I'm a part of, is your one-stop resource for any kind of pest problem. And our website provides science-based, safe and effective solutions for all kinds of challenges like weeds, plant diseases, insects, and rodents, which we'll be talking about today. Um, UC Master Gardeners, uh, Marin Master Gardeners, newly designed website is uh, an incredible resource for anything and everything related to your Marin Gardens. And best of all, they have a help desk where you can contact a Marin Master Gardener to get personalized advice. And um, we will be sending you resources and links to everything that I'm mentioning here. So please do, um, do feel free to look for that in your email as we go uh, after the seminar is over. Um, one of our speakers today is Dr. Carolyn Whitesell, um, and she is with University of California, ANR. Um, Dr. Whitesell is a human wildlife interactions advisor with UC um, Agricultural and Natural Resources. Also, many of you know it as uh, with their work with the Cooperative Extension. Her work focuses on minimizing negative interactions with a variety of species, including rats, coyotes, and mountain lions in both urban and rural areas around the Bay Area. She has a PhD in ecology from UC Davis and has conducted research for many years on large carnivores in Southern Africa. Our other speaker, which we'll be beginning with in just a moment, is Allison Hermance, and she's the Director of Communications and Marketing for Wild Care. Um, she's been with Wild Care for nearly 20 years, speaking and writing extensively to help people navigate the boundaries where people and wildlife come into contact. Allison's work with Wild Care focuses on helping people live well with wildlife. So again, uh, we appreciate all of you being here. Um, as we go, please pop your questions into the chat. If you're having any technical difficulties, you can also reach um, our facilitators in the chat. And I'll turn it over to Allison as we start our presentation with the best ways to manage rats. Thank you, Allison. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rika. I am just thrilled to be here. This is such a great opportunity to be part of a, an incredible group of people all working together to toward that same goal as at Wise Wild Care says, helping people live well with wildlife. So I think probably many of our viewers are familiar with Wild Care, the organization. We are a wildlife hospital and nature education center located in downtown San Rafael. I am very bleached out. I'm sorry if I'm a little hard to look at, but I'll try to scoot back a little bit. Um, but we are uh, in our wildlife hospital every year. We take care of over 3,500 ill, injured, and orphaned wild animals. We work with over 35,000 children and adults through our nature education programs. And of course, we also do a tremendous amount of wildlife advocacy, advocating for the environment, habitats, and the animals with whom we share our environment. So the Wildlife Hospital, of course, we treat around 3,500 animals every year, between 3,500 and 4,000. And we treat over 200 different species in the Wildlife Hospital. And it is a very interesting thing at Wild Care that we treat both rodents and rodent predators. And you can see that picture in the upper right-hand corner of, our, of your screen on the slide. Those are a baby rat and a baby squirrel. And what is fascinating about that photo to me is that both of those animals are exactly the same age. They're a little more than three weeks old. And you can see how underdeveloped the baby squirrel is compared to the baby rat. Baby rat is almost completely furred. His eyes are still closed. You can't tell really in that photo. His eyes are still closed though. And uh, they, he's still a very young rat, but you can see how quickly rats develop even compared to other rodents. And I just thought that was such an interesting photo to show those two animals side by side, side by side. So of course we treat the rodents in the wildlife hospital and we treat a lot of, of rodent predators as well. And actually most of the predators that wild care sees in the wildlife hospital, your hawks, your owls, your bobcats, coyotes, raccoons, skunks, all of those animals, the primary diet that those animals have is rodents. So that is mostly what they are eating and certainly 
when those rodent predators come into contact with humans and human-caused garbage and things that attract rats in particular. And then when humans put out poison, especially for those rats, you end up with a situation called secondary poisoning where the animals are in, uh, that have come into contact with the poison, oop, that's gonna go too far, I can tell, end up being poisoned themselves. So after seeing that happen far, far, far too many times in Wild Cares Wildlife Hospital, we decided to actually do a scientific study and see if we could determine what level of poison is in the bodies of the animals that eat the rodents in our environment. And after we started those studies in 2006, we did a couple of years of very intensive testing and that map that you see on the screen actually shows uh, uh, just a, a visual of where in a certain period of time, I think it was a three or four month period where all of our poisoned animals came from. Really kind of a shocking visual and showing that throughout the areas where people live, that is where rat poison is being used and 76% of the patients tested that came into the wildlife hospital for whatever reason, they didn't come in because of poisoning. Some of them may have, but most of them didn't. 76% of rodent predators are walking around with anticoagulant rat poison in their systems. And of course, that's a very detrimental health thing for animals of all species, including the target rodents. You'll see the red-tailed hawk on the right-hand side. That's kind of a hard photo, I know. But that red-tailed hawk is uh, demonstrating the typical symptoms of an animal that has died from the results of secondary poisoning. It's uh, an anticoagulant, which causes the body to bleed out, and it ends up um, bleeding out. The, the bird bleeds out through the nose, and it's, uh, or the nares. It's a, it, it's, it's a very unpleasant, very unpleasant way to go. Um, and seeing that too often in the wildlife hospital really has made the advocating against the use of rat poisons to be one of the major advocacy issues that wild care really works on. And, and we've had some success. Our taste testing data has been used extensively to create bans on the use of that particular way of controlling rodents. But the fact is, the any lethal way to control another wildlife species is going to have unintended consequences. Certainly the unintended consequences of using poison are very, very obvious and they are scientifically proven to move up the food chain and cause wreak havoc on, on all species that are, that are moving up the food chain. But the other types of lethal rodent control also have similar things. And Dr. Whitesell in her wonderful presentation that you'll see after mine uh, talks about some of those, you know, animals getting their paws stuck in traps, um, glue traps, absolutely one of the worst things in the entire universe, never, never use them. We'll talk about that. But uh, you are looking at unintended consequences to other wildlife and to the environment at large anytime you use lethal, lethal methods to control a wildlife species uh, in this situation. Of course, we're talking about rats. So the fact is the only way to permanently eliminate a nuisance wildlife problem, a nuisance rodent problem is to remove what's attracting the animals. Now, I realize that's very, very challenging and many of our viewers are gardeners and these are animals coming into your garden. And then that's of course where we have Dr. Whitesell to give us uh, her incredible information. But just think about the only way to permanently get rid of an animal problem, a nuisance animal problem, is to eliminate what's attracting those animals. And that is almost always going to be a food source, a water source, or shelter and harborage. And the probably the number one attractant to rodents in our, in our suburban areas especially is bird feeders. And I'm not gonna tell you to stop using your bird feeder. My parents would kill me if I were to say that, but uh, certainly fallen bird seed is one of the absolute biggest attractants for rodents coming into people's yards. And if you are having a problem with rodents in your garden, there's a very good chance that it might be your bird feeder or it might be your neighbor's bird feeder that are attracting a large number of rodents in. So. You don't have to get rid of your bird feeder, but certainly sweeping up the bird seed every single night is going to dramatically reduce the number of rodents, rats especially, 
that you get into your yard. Uh, bird baths, water out for pets, food put out for pets, all of those things are going to attract wildlife and attract rodents as well. Another thing that people don't think about necessarily that attracts rodents is safe passageways for rats to travel. And ivy is a very good example of a safe passage, a harborage for rodents to be able to travel through their environment without exposing themselves to predators like that gray horned owl that we see in silhouette on my image there. And uh, so eliminating that type of ground cover that causes easy access for rodents to move between your yard and maybe the yard of the person next door who has bird seed out for them, that type of thing, eliminating what is attracting the animals will eliminate eliminate the problem within within reason. So I know I know it doesn't always take care of it completely, but it is the only way to completely eliminate a nuisance problem. And that is very much one of the advocacy messages that wild care uses as well. And we really want people to be aware of that. Uh, you can also use natural predators in your solutions to eliminate rodents. And certainly this works for gophers as well and other species of rodents. The Hungry Owl Project is a program of wild care and we have owl boxes for sale. We have barn owl boxes, screech owl boxes. We actually also ask, offer bat boxes and bluebird boxes, which are useful for eliminating insect predators. You see the website there, hungryowls.org. That's your resource to find out if your property might be a good site for a barn owl box or a screech owl box and invite those natural predators into your garden and into your space and really give the environment and the animals that nature has provided to help us control rodent populations, inviting them in and making them part of your solution. So removing what is attracting, working as much as you can to prevent that food, water, and shelter from being accessible to rodents. And then also introducing natural predators can be a really good solution. Wildcare has a lot of resources on our website. You see our website address there, discoverwildcare.org. Hungryowls.org also has a number of really great resources to help you humanely and effectively control rodent populations. I really hope you'll visit those. And of course, I'm here for the rest of our presentation here and we'll be able to answer questions at the end. I have a, a 10 minute window and I'm about done with that. So I am now going to pass over the baton to the amazing Dr. Carolyn Whitesell. Let me stop sharing my screen here and Dr. Whitesell, take it away. Great, thanks Allison. Hi everyone. I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen here. All right. So thanks for joining me. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about rat management with a focus on gardens um, and how do we protect all those uh, delicious veggies that we work so hard to grow. And I'll be having a particular focus on trapping as uh, a management tool. And I chose this <laughs> cover slide uh, because it can sometimes feel like managing the rats in our yard um, is one big game of whack-a-mole. And I want to highlight uh, the term management, uh, not solution, um, because given the reproductive rates and some other uh, facts about rodents that I'll be mentioning, um, the problem's not gonna go away and that's the reality of it. But we need to figure out what is the best way to manage um, these animals and get them to a level uh, where they're not, where they're able to coexist um, and they're not causing severe problems on our property. So today I'm gonna to be going over best management practices for rodent control. So first I'm gonna be describing how do we identify rodent activity hotspots? And this is gonna be really important in helping us determine where we should locate traps. Then I'll be going over accurate identification of the pest to species level. Um, we'll be going over the three different commensal species that you can potentially have in your property in Marin. And again, this is also going to be important in helping select which trap and where to place it. I'll be going over sanitation as a management tool, as well as exclusion, because in some cases, exclusion may actually offer the best level of protection, given what your garden looks like. And then I'll be going over lethal control, where the focus today is solely going to be on trapping. 
So first off, what is a commensal rodent? What are we talking about today? Well, they live close to humans and they rely on us for resources. So their food, water, and shelter. And really control of these is going to be key to successful management of them. So there are many aspects of rodent biology that make them so successful and difficult to control. And I personally love this photo. I believe it was taken in New York City, but it's incredible how agile and the athleticism of rats and mice. And you can actually see this rat climbing up between garbage cans. And there's so many videos of them, you know, scaling walls that you would never think they'd be able to get grip on, but they can. Rodents are also incredibly adaptable. They've really figured out how to be successful in living in human dominated environments. And one of the main ways that they're able to be so adaptable is due to their diet. Their diet is very wide. So they're able to uh, capitalize on all of the different food resources that we happen to be providing them. Also their size, right? They're hard to catch, they're hard to see, they're able to hide and move through very small areas. Um, so it can be difficult to even know that we have a rat or mouse problem. And reproduction, I'll have a slide later that I'll you know, kind of spell it out more, but they reproduce at a very high rate. Um, and that's also going to be why it's so important in our trapping program to make sure that we're trying to trap the adult reproductively active individuals first. And their behavior, they're very smart um, and they are oftentimes uh, for rats more so than mice, they can be quite neophobic. And I'll be mentioning this term throughout the talk today. And neophobia is going to be a fear of new things. So they're gonna be quite cautious the first time you set out a trap or there's something new in their environment. They're not uh, rat for rats, mice not so much, but rats are gonna be wary. They wanna figure out and make sure it's safe before they approach it. And that again is going to impact how we run a trapping program. So the three types of commensal rodents that I wanna to discuss today are the house mouse, the Norway rat, and the roof rat. So first house mice, <laughs> good term to describe them is mammalian weeds because they have such a high reproduct reproductive rate. Uh, in color, they're light brownish to gray. They have an almost hairless tail. And an adult is only gonna be about five to seven inches long, including the tail. So they're significantly smaller uh, than the commensal rats. Their skull height is only a quarter inch. And that means that is the only limiting size for a space that they can get through. If you have an opening that's larger than a quarter inch, they're going to be able to squeeze through. And I, I know if you look at a house mouse, it can be hard to imagine them squeezing through such a small space, but they can. And so when we're trying to exclude them, that's something to keep in mind. Um, anything larger than a quarter inch, they're going to be able to fit through. And they have moderately large ears for their body size. Now, house mice are omnivorous, which makes them incredibly difficult to control through food alone. Um, so if we remove one food source, they can quickly search, uh, switch to a different one. They prefer seeds and grains uh, because they spend a lot of time on the ground. They often consume uh, dog food in urban areas. And for all of these rodents, uh, you know, really making sure to not leave dog food out overnight is gonna be helpful um, in minimizing and attracting the rodents uh, to your property. Now, house mice are not neophobic about new foods. Um, so the rats can be, but house mice, they're gonna be willing to try different foods. So you don't necessarily have to be as uh, picky about what bait you would use. In general, they may prefer foods that are high with fat, protein, and sugar. And they can also survive with very little water. So removing water sources um, from your backyard isn't gonna be as effective for house mice as it will be for other rodents because they don't need a lot of water. So they'll still be able to you know, figure out some other source. In general, house mice are nocturnal. However, it's not unusual to see them during the day even during low infestations. And I wanna mention that because just by seeing a house mouse during the day doesn't mean you're dealing with a massive infestation. I don't want you to unnecessarily get really worried. They often utilize corners and that's something to keep in mind when we're placing traps. 
However, you know, mice are like us, they all have their individual personalities and move around in ways that they prefer. So not all mice will run along walls. Um, you will occasionally, you know, see them running through a completely open space. And again, that isn't abnormal in and of itself. I will say if you see one house mouse, you have many more than one. <laughs> um, given their reproductive rate, it is incredible. Um, so you're not just going to have one mouse, you do have a population of mice if you see them. Now, on to rats. So let's talk about Norway versus roof rats. Roof rats first, uh, they're very sleek and agile. They're between five to 10 ounces. And one of the defining features for them is very large ears, like the image shown here. And they have small black eyes and their color can really range. You know, typically we'll see them being light brownish to gray, but sometimes you'll even see them with a hint of red. Um, so their color range is quite wide. They have a uniformly dark tail with fine scales. And an adult's body is between six and eight inches long, but their tail alone is between seven and a half and eight and a half inches long. So another defining characteristic of roof rat is that their tail is as long or longer than the length of their head and body. They're nocturnal and they're secretive and elusive. And that's actually some of the reasons why they're so hard to control. Outside, they like to establish nests in dense shrubs, bushes, and other types of lush vegetation. And as Allison mentioned, uh, you know, roof rats, they're going to utilize vegetation for movement. And they'll love using overgrown vegetation. So if you have a lot of ivy, um, you know, near your fence line, they will love to um, use that for movement. You'll also see them running along property fences and walls and even utility lines. Um, when they're choosing a place to nest, they do love dead fronds of unmanaged palm trees. But that being said, even if you do manage your palm trees and trim them, they sometimes will also nest in very well managed palm trees. Um, so trimming the palm trees in and of itself isn't guaranteed to be a solution um, to keep them out from nesting. But you'll typically find them, you know, in places like fence ledges behind thick overgrown vines and vegetation. Um, they'll even nest under cavities of garden sheds if you have any space under there. Um, they love the, you know, within thick brush where they can use all that brush to run along. Uh, behind or within yard trash piles can be quite attractive for nesting. Um, in wood piles as well or in buildings you know, attics, behind, behind large structural beams, ceilings, et cetera. And I certainly recommend, you know, we'll be getting to exclusion later, um, but remember the in buildings part because, you know, this happened to uh, my mom in the past where it turned out there was a roof rat nest in her own attic and then they were just running out and accessing the vegetable garden right there. They didn't even have to go very far. Um, so you don't wanna be providing, you know, really great nesting sites because then of course they're gonna be utilizing um, your vegetable garden. So roof rats can exist more independently of humans than other commensal species, which also is gonna make them more difficult to control. They have a wide range of natural foods that they can access. So even if we take away all of our anthropogenic foods, um, they'll still be able to find something else. Now that being said, we should try to minimize their access to anthropogenic foods because we don't want to support, you know, an even larger population than the natural foods can support on their own. But when we're thinking natural foods, you know, all types of seeds, nuts, fruits, and berries. So not plants that you're cultivating, but just wild uh, nuts and fruits. They'll even go after slugs and snails, which, you know, can be a benefit <laughs> to a garden, I suppose. Um, they'll also go after cockroaches and even fish and shellfish. So if you have, you know, a pond with fish in it, um, that can also be a food source for roof rats. In terms of anthropogenic food, of course, dog food, you know, trash cans, a big one, citrus and nuts from backyard fruit trees and orchards, as Allison mentioned, bird feeders. Um, and, you know, the rats will come in and access the food from bird feeders and that then they can be attracting other species like coyotes. Um, that happens quite a lot. So if you don't want coyotes in your yard, 
may want to reconsider um, bird feeders and other of the other sources of these food types for them. Um, and also, you know, increase in the number of people having chickens um, or raising sheep and goats on their property. So remember that the grain that's in livestock pens or lots, uh, that can also be a really great food source for rats. Roof rat behavior, they mostly forage at dawn and dusk. So this may be when you're most likely to see them. And they can actually uh, forage in family groups. So it's not gonna be unusual to see multiple roof rats together, you know, even up to 10. They're gonna feed in areas that afford good protection. And they can carry food back to either a more secluded area or back to their nest. Now, roof rats tend to eat small amounts of food in several places. And that's something to keep in mind when you're placing your traps, um, because you may not want to just place all of the traps in one section, right? If you have multiple areas in your yard that you've identified as having, as being a rod uh, rodent hotspot, you're going to want to place traps in all of them. Uh, some researchers claim that neophobia in roof rats is more pronounced than in Norway rats, and this may, um, you know, help with why roof rats are so much more difficult to control than Norway rats are. Roof rats can also travel considerable distances for food. So, you know, typically between 100 and 300 feet, uncommonly as far as 1,000 feet. And so what this means is they can easily live in one area and feed in another. So depending upon how large your property is, it may very well be your neighbor's rats that are coming onto your property and accessing your garden. Um, so keep that in mind um, that they can travel you know, quite a good distance, especially when we're talking more urban areas with smaller lot sizes. Now switching over to Norway rats, Norway rats are the most widely distributed and predominant rat species in the US. Uh, they can also exist independently of people and structures. They can exist in natural and semi-natural environments. Although populations that aren't associated with humans do tend to be smaller. Norway rats are gonna be much larger and robust than roof rats. They typically weigh more, you know, between seven to even up to 18 ounces. And their defining characteristic is they have very small ears um, given their head size. And they also do have small eyes. Colors, they're typically, you know, brownish or reddish gray above, but they're gonna have a whitish gray on their belly. The adult is between eight to 10 inches long, but the tail is also only between seven to 10 inches long. So their tail is going to be shorter than their body. So that's a big difference between them and roof rats. So, and the tail itself is gonna be darker above and paler below and scaly. Now they have a much smaller home range than roof rats. So their home range is typically only between 25 and 100 feet. And when the resources are plentiful, the home range tends to be closer to 25 feet. Though of course the exact number is gonna vary depending upon season, sex, and population density. But what this means is that, again, depending upon your lot size, you're more likely that any Norway rats that you're catching on your property are probably nesting somewhere on your property. So that can be useful to try to figure out where they're nesting. They also tend to eat a large amount from small number of food sources. So once they find a really great resource, they're just going to be coming back to it, you know, night after night. And so you can be more targeted in just setting your traps um, in that one location. And they're also quite neophobic. Again, very wide diet, uh, fairly similar to roof rats, you know, in urban settings, garbage, bird seed, dog food. Um, compost is one that people do often forget about. So if you have compost, make sure that it um, is secured and not available for rodents. And they will actually, they're big enough, they will go after backyard livestock itself, um, not just the feed. Now in more natural environments or their natural food, um, they're going to be going over insects. They'll go after birds, you know, nestlings and eggs, carry on, you know, nuts, berries, fruits, cereals and corn, um, also on the ground and aquatic animals. 
Now, if you catch a rodent and you aren't sure what it is, um, the smallest is going to be the house mouse. So you might want to measure it. And, you know, if it's only between five, to seven inches total, it's going to be house mouse most likely. Um, but you do want to rule out whether it's a juvenile rat. Um, so you'll want to look at if the tail of the rat is longer than its body. And when you fold down the ears, the ears cover the eyes, like shown in this um, photo right here, then the species is a roof rat. Whereas if the uh, tail is shorter than the body and it has these tiny ears, so if you fold it down, the ears or the eyes are still clearly visible, then you have a Norway rat. Now for rat reproduction, I'll just quickly do the math for you um, just as an example. So if we have one rat, typically breeds four times in a year and each litter is gonna have about eight pups, you know, gets to 32. If we assume half of them are female and breed only once a year, we have that keep going, keep going with the, the math there and you can end up with 160 rats. Uh, so, really trying to catch a reproductively active female rat will have a large impact um, on you know, the number of potential rats that you're gonna have going after your ripe fruit um, you know, during, the during the summer or whenever your um, fruit is ripening. So onto uh, some control suggestions. Sanitation, and I know Allison mentioned this, but really, uh, can't stress this enough, as much as possible, trying to remove and limit access to, you know, other food sources, harborage and water. And really sanitation is gonna be one of the most environmentally friendly options. It doesn't have a risk to non-targets and you're actually gonna get benefits um, in, you know, removing, attracting other species, not only rodents. And it can end up being fairly cost-effective. And so when you're looking at your yard, you know, think through, are there small adjustments you can make? Is your trash covered? Are you cleaning up your leaf piles, minimizing harborage? And is your compost fully contained in rodent proof um, and enclosure? Which brings me to exclusion. So I would, you know, if you know you have rodents in your yard, I would definitely double check that your house and you know, any sheds or garage doesn't have any open entry points. Now remember, any hole, you know, that's a quarter inch, mice can get into. Um, they need to be a little bit larger for rats, but if we wanna just make sure it's rodent proof, you don't want any holes larger than a quarter inch. Um, roof rats do, you know, that's really common for them to be trying to nest in your house. So that's something that we want to prevent. Um, you know, when you're thinking through how to close up any of these holes that you found, keep in mind, Norway and roof rats, they're likely to gnaw away any plastic sheeting, even wood or caulking or any less sturdy materials. So doing something like hardware cloth, um, which you can get at, you know, Home Depot, um, that is, you know, and get it quarter inch, quarter inch hardware cloth and use that to cover up any holes on your house um, will help keep the rats out. And for exclusion for home gardens as well, you know, keep, keep an eye on how large is the area that you're trying to keep rats out of. So how many plants are you trying to protect? Now, if you have a really large vegetable garden, then it may not be practical to, you know, create an enclosure um, for all of those plants. But if you have, you know, a single raised bed, let's say in a few tomato plants, um, you know, I don't typically have the rats going after my peppers, but you can have that. But I know the tomatoes, it is a constant battle every year to keep them out of my tomatoes. Um, and if you have just a few plants, then honestly, exclusion can be a really effective option for that, where you, you know, can use hardware cloth, quarter inch, um, to create an enclosure around those few plants. And that, then you know, you know, the rats aren't gonna be able to get into it. So I would recommend considering that as an option. Now, if there's too many plants to have it be practical to exclude rodents, let's talk about trapping. 
And I do want to preface it by saying, you know, there is a lot of information that we still don't know about rodents. Uh, there is ongoing research on, you know, different efficacies of different trapping methods, et cetera. Um, so what I can do today is just to give strategies and tips for what we currently know. But I will say, you know, in a few years, hopefully we'll have some new information as research is always continuing um, to improve our understanding of these rodents and how best to manage them. So a question that I often am asked is which trap should I use? And you know what, there isn't really good data comparing the efficacy of these different traps. Uh, that's something that is still an active uh, part of research. So I can talk about strategies for using them and I'll go over the different kinds of traps that you can see in the store or see online and some pros and cons of each of them. Do keep in mind when choosing a trap, the size matters. Um, you are not going to catch a mouse in a rat trap. People often think like, oh, a trap is a trap and you know, a mouse will go after it. You won't. If you have a house, mice pro house mouse problem, you're going to need to get a mouse sized trap. And conversely, if you're trying to go after rats, you need to get a rat sized trap. And that's again, why it's so important to identify um, which rodents you're trying to manage. So these snap traps, um, Victor old time brand, um, you may have seen them. So these ones, you know, they will catch, they're quite powerful. These are the original traps here and you can see the small trigger right here. And so that's what you would place the bait on. Um, and once it gets triggered, then you have this bar flip down. Now, newer models you may see have this expanded trigger. So it's a much larger area. Um, and the idea being, you know, the rat doesn't have to come quite as far. There, there's a lot larger area that the rat can touch and set this trap off. So, you know, potentially a pro there, but I will say, um, you know, anecdotally what I've been hearing from people is that because there's a larger area where the rat can set the trap off, the head isn't necessarily in the perfect location for a clean kill shot. So if the rat's you know, nose barely touches this edge here and the trap goes off, it may not be a kill shot. Um, and you know, that's, that's not what we're aiming for. You can have just an injured rat in the trap. So that's something to, to keep in mind with any of these traps that have expanded triggers that can potentially happen. Um, I will say from personal experience using the Victor traps, they can, they're very powerful and that means they can be a little hard to set. Um, so if you're struggling, you know, with the hand strength or just are, you know, a little nervous using such, um, you know, a high pressured trap, that is something you, um, you know, maybe this isn't the best trap for you. And again, they, uh, these Victor traps come in both rat and mouse sizes. And the mouse sizes, um, I will say, they're considerably easy to, easier to set than the rat traps. Now, there are also these, you know, clam type traps. These are much easier to set. Um, so if you're struggling with some of the other snap traps, these are much easier. Um, they also, some of them have this expanded trigger, which can have, um, you know, the same issues as I explained with the Victor. And this, you know, would be where you'd place the bait in there. Now there's a fairly, or a much newer trap um, that's come out. The brand is Good Nature. It's the A24 trap. Now this is the most expensive trap on the market. Um, it's over a hundred dollars a May, gosh, you can be closer to 200, but so it, it's expensive. That's a, a con right there. Um, the positives of this trap is that it's self-resetting. So you can set it out and you know only check it once every six months. Um, and how it works is it uses pressure. So it has this gas cartridge attached to it. And that gas cartridge is what powers the trap. Um, and so it just you know closes and then automatically reopens and is reset. Um, so if another rat comes to access the bait, it can get that one too. So that's a big, you know, pro to not have to be checking these traps on a daily basis. Now, I had a colleague that found um, significantly increased efficacy 
by placing this trap on a platform, such as shown here, um, putting the trap you know, on this piece of plywood and then placing the wood on the tree really increased his capture rate um, versus just placing the trap directly on the tree. There's also tunnel traps like these. Uh, they're often marketed online as being um, used for squirrels. They do work also for rats. Um, and I've you know, used these and have had success with rats. Um, for them, they are also a, on the harder side to set. You need quite a bit of strength to push it down. Um, a, you know, a potential pro is that you don't have to bait them. You can. Um, but you can also just place them along uh, movement paths. So, you know, on top of a fence, if you've seen rats using that fence line um, or just anywhere, you know, you've been seeing rats or there's rat sign, um, you can place them there and that will, uh, you know, be very, if, <laughs> if the rat runs through it, they'll get caught. Also, one of the reasons I had tried using these um, is because you know, the length, depending upon how large your dog's snout is, um, they may not even be able to uh, get their nose within, um, far enough within the trap to set it off. Um, so for my larger dogs, I was more comfortable having this trap out and I wasn't using bait. So there was nothing to attract um, the dog to this trap. Whereas, you know, with the clam traps or the victors, you know, I, I can't have the dogs in the yard when I have those traps set. So that is something to consider and we'll be discussing non-targets um, further on as well. Now there are electric traps, um, which you may have seen. And some people, you know, swear by these and have really good luck with them. Um, I will say, be careful when we're using them outside, right? California drought, um, any area with high fire risk, these are electric. Um, so just be aware you don't want to somehow short and start a fire. I, I certainly wouldn't place these, you know, in dry grass, <laughs> for example. Um, I would just be cognizant of where you're placing them. And we're still going to need to pre-bait these traps. Now, as a cooperative extension advisor, uh, you know, my role is to describe the available options to you and you can then um, decide what do you want to use. So I do just want to mention that, you know, if you're in a store or browsing online, you may come across glue traps, um, such as the one here. Um, how these work is they are, um, you know, a, a flat, very, very sticky surface. And what that means is anything that touches them will get stuck. That can be, you know, a lizard or a bird or a rat or your grandchild. Um, they're very, very powerful in terms of stick. Um, so non-targets are a real concern here. Um, for that, I wouldn't recommend using them in outside settings. And Allison of Wildcare is gonna briefly jump in and talk a little bit more um, about, you know, Wildcare's experience with glue traps um, and their perspective on it. Yes, thank you so much for the opportunity. These are the most horrific things on the planet. What people don't realize about glue trips, glue traps, is that there's nothing actually on the trap to kill the animal. The way the animal dies is by starving and dehydration and exposure. So he's stuck. He can't move. He can't run away. He can't get off. And all he does is sit there until he dies. So people think, oh, I set out the trap. The animal will be dead. Well, three days later, he still might not be. And it's really interesting at Wild Care how often I do wanna say in all of these trapping situations, if you have an animal that is injured by a trap, we do take care of those animals at Wild Care and we see that frequently. And the number of times that we've seen people bring in actual rats and mice, the intended target stuck to glue traps with the person saying, I had no idea this is what was the horrible thing that was going to happen. So yes, I think you'll see them. And I'm so, you know, of course you have to know what they are, but never, ever, ever, ever use them. They are absolutely unbelievably cruel, both to the target species and to the non-target. Thanks for the opportunity to jump in, Dr. Whitesell. No worries. Thanks, Allison. All right. All right, so um, let's talk about 
bait as well. So I have this little video here uh, of a rat really liking this Pringle chip or potentially it's Lay's. Um, so figuring out what to use for bait is also gonna be you know, important to think through when we're talking about rats, house mice, they'll, they'll pretty much eat anything, um, but rats are going to be a little bit pickier. So for rats, neophobia to new food containers is also far stronger than neophobia to new foods. So while we do have to be cognizant of what they're going to eat, but it's also where they're going to eat it that they're very neophobic about. Um, and what this means is that, you know, you can put out a you know, brand new trap, you've gone to the store, put the trap out with some food. It may take even a few weeks for the rats in your yard to be willing to approach that new trap and actually try to access the food. Um, so patient, patience is key. Now, so what to use for bait? Uh, consider using locally available resources. Unfortunately, in your garden, this is the things that you are trying to protect. Um, you know, rats, if they're going after your fruits and veggies, then, you know, they like them. Um, and you can actually use some of them for bait. Um, otherwise, you know, things like peanut butter, tried and, tried and true, um, could be quite popular with rats, even peanuts. Um, I've heard of people using, you know, candy bars, tiny pieces, um, you know, Kit Kats. So if you, if you put out bait and you're not getting any hits and it's been a long time, um, I would consider switching up the bait and seeing maybe it's you know, simply if the rats aren't attracted to that food source. Now, one tip that I know is really counterintuitive is to not overbait. So this is actually way more bait than you need. The reason for this is because you don't want a situation like this. So we have this clam trap and we have a glob of bait and there's so much bait in the bait cup that it actually is above the trigger plate. So this rat's thinking about it. Oh, there we go. So the rat's actually able to get the bait, never sets off this trap. They're incredibly agile. So keep that in mind. Um, the ideal amount of bait that you should be using in any of these traps is only about the size of a pea. That's all you need. Um, and I know it's hard to move away from like, oh, the more food I put out, the more likely I am for a rat to get it. Actually, it's counterintuitive, but no, you want a very tiny amount of bait. If you use, you know, just a pea-sized amount and you place it right, you know, at the bottom of this uh, tray for the bait, that's gonna force the rat to stick its entire head in to grab it. And it's gonna be much more likely to actually set off the trigger. Now, another recommendation is going to be clustering your traps. Um, if we think back to roof rat behavior, remember they can be foraging in groups up to 10. So another question I often get is, you know, how many traps do I need? And unfortunately, we don't have a scientifically based uh, number to give you. It really just depends. Um, but what I can say is that in general, the more the merrier. Um, certainly one trap is not enough. Um, so the more traps you can place, um, you know, the higher the likelihood that you'll be able to, you know, catch the rats and actually have a meaningful impact on the rat population on your property. Um, and when we think about, you know, identifying where rodent hotspots are, um, you know, thinking through, are we seeing different rodent signs? So kind of the easiest in your yard is going to be rodent poop. Um, if you're seeing, you know, along your shed or on your patio, you know, underneath um, patio furniture, rats sometimes will move under there, especially if they're pushed up against a wall. So you keep an eye out. You know, and if you start seeing um, rodent droppings, then that can be a great place um, to be putting a series of traps, like as shown here. Oh, another thing I want to mention, um, just to increase your, your trapping efficacy and efficiency, is securing your traps either to the ground or to the fence, wherever they're at. Um, and if you aren't able to you know, if you don't want to, let's say, nail the trap um, directly to 
the fence, you can actually place these traps like here. Um, they're shown that the traps themselves um, are also attached to a piece of wood. And then the wood itself is, you know, tied to a tree. And I should have a photo of that later um, or on the ground or on the fence. And what that does is by attaching the trap to something like a solid surface, you're then allowing all of the energy of the trap closing to go into closing versus, you know, if you've ever set off a trap and it jumps in the air. So that force is actually getting lost because it's, you know, going to leaping into the air versus closing tightly and hard um, for an effective kill shot. So you can actually improve, um, you know, the, the catching rate and making sure it's a kill shot um, if you're able to secure the trap and make all of that force go into closing. So here's some other just, you know, examples where we can put some traps along here. Um, but then, you know, if we suspect that the rats are also coming from the top of the fence and then going down this pole and then along it, um, really just put as many traps as you can out to where you think the, the rodents are moving. Here's an example where we have um, two traps set on a piece of wood because then we're able to put the wood and just tape it into the tree uh, where we're losing a lot of fruit. Um, whereas, you know, putting the trap directly onto this branch would be really tricky because the branch is curved. Um, and again, when we're putting traps along um, an area where the rodents are moving, at least pairing them and having them face out. So, you know, for the clam traps, this is where we would be catching the rat. So here and here. So by putting them in both directions, regardless of which direction the rat is moving, it's going to encounter the bait and can get caught. Now, pre-baiting is also, <laughs> it can be a little hard to, to it seems counterintuitive, but trust me, um, this is essentially the most important thing you can do to ensure you're successful in managing your rat population and your rodent problem. And what we mean by pre-baiting is that when you first put out your traps, don't set them, but do put out, this is the time when you can put out a lot of bait. So you set them out, you put a ton of bait here, and then you wait for you know, a few days to a week for the rats to be, get comfortable enough to start eating that bait. And once they're comfortable enough to be accessing the bait and they're used to the traps, they're no longer wary of them, then we can go ahead and set the trap and then we wanna use that you know, pea-sized amount of bait. And the reason for that is because we wanna catch the right rat. Because remember the calculation when you know, one female rat can produce was 160, that female adult reproductive rat is gonna be a lot smarter and harder to catch than the youngsters. So yes, if you set out a trap on day one with some bait in it, you may very well catch a rat. You're very likely that it's you know, a teenage rat, a young one that isn't quite as wary, isn't quite as smart about you know, evading threats. Um, and while you've caught that one rat, that's not the one reproducing and having lots of rat babies that are then gonna be going after your garden. We really wanna be going after these adult ones. And that's gonna have um, a much larger impact on managing the rat population in your property. So for example, here we have a reproductively active male and we really wanna be getting those adults first. Now overcoming neophobia, I just have a video here to show more about what I'm talking about. So this is a you know bait box, this is what the video is of. And there's food in there that we know the rat wants to eat. And they know this rat will eat that food but the rat is not willing to go inside. Just thinking about it, you know, considering, oh, it's th th thought about it, right? It's stuck its head in, but it wasn't, wasn't comfortable enough to go all the way, still thinking about it. And then that's it. This can last weeks. Rats are, you know, they're very wary. Um, they don't want to just run in and start eating something. They want to make sure they're comfortable with it. And this is where patience is really key. Now, as Allison mentioned, non-target trap casualties, this is absolutely a concern. 
um, that you need to be aware of. And while traps, you know, they're great at reducing um, the use of pesticides, but they aren't completely foolproof either for having impacts on non-targets. And unfortunately, um, the bait that we're using in these traps, lots of other species like to access as well. And I doubt it's going to be a good morning if you come out and you have a very angry skunk in one of your traps that you now have to try to set free. I um, mean, Allison was going to jump in again because wild care has lots of experience um, in needing to try to rescue, um, you know, other animals that were not meant to get caught in a trap, but ended up being in one. Go yes, ahead, thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, uh, the first thing I wanted to say is that if you do have an animal that has gotten a paw or another body part caught in the trap, please, please bring that animal to wild care or to your local wildlife care center as quickly as possible because the injuries that they get from that constriction and from the trap are injuries that get worse over time and need a considerable amount of treatment. And we see all the time in the wildlife hospital, we get dozens of rat trap skunks every year. And that really is such a huge concern to placing your traps outside and placing your traps in places where other animals can get them. Um, we always strongly, absolutely, if you're going to use traps in any sort of outdoor situation, placing them in the boxes that make them less accessible to other animals and and but even even the ones in the boxes can be a challenge with the skunks because they really like to reach their reach their paws in um, uh, placing traps outside can be really really hazardous to other animals and and they should always be contained um, just from our standpoint because we see that so very very much all right thanks allison so yeah like as she mentioned with you know other types of boxes here are a few suggestions um, that you can you know, use to reduce, it doesn't eliminate non-target risk, um, especially you know, a box like this, you would need to uh, very tightly secure it to the ground because you know, I mean, this, a raccoon would have no problem just pulling it off and going after the bait. Um, so you'd really have to make sure to you know, set in some deep stakes or something to really try to make this um, very difficult to pull off. Um, another suggestion that I learned from a colleague uh, where they had a lot of non-target concerns, it was in an urban setting, um, what they ended up doing that worked well for them is they placed non-toxic bait, so just typical bait, within a commercial bait box. Um, so these are you know, what you would typically use for baiting, but instead of bait, um, once they you know, knew that rats were using and accessing this commercial bait box, they then just placed snack traps within the commercial bait box. Um, because these, those bait boxes are designed to try to limit non-targets, again, if you have you know, a family of skunks that lives in your yard, probably this won't keep them out most likely. Um, but it is you know, reducing the likelihood if you, you know, don't think that you have any of these other species regularly using your yard, um, this can help keep, you know, dogs out um, and other non-targets. So just another idea to try to, you know, think, think of creative ways um, to try to make it so that rats can access these traps, but other species can't. Um, another good suggestion is to modify the trapping time to avoid killing songbirds, because even birds are going to get caught in this. Um, and there's really no need from a management perspective to be having these traps set during the day. And if we look at, you know, rodent detections per hour of the day, you see during, during daylight hours when the bird, songbirds are going to be active, um, you're not going to be catching rats anyways. So those, any traps you have set out, um, it's really just a hazard and it's not providing any benefit. Um, so yes, I mean, it is more work to need to you know, set traps at dusk and then release them or put them somewhere else um, in the morning. But you know, that definitely is going to help reduce the chances that you're gonna catch a songbird. Um, and then lastly, I do wanna mention, so people ask often, what about just catch and release? Like what if I use these live traps that I see in the store and I see online um, and I've you know, maybe heard my neighbor use and I just catch the rat and then I just move it. I have this great park 
down the road, why can't the rat just go live there? Uh, well, in the state of California, that is illegal. You cannot catch um, an animal and release it elsewhere without a, you know, a permit from California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I can tell you now, you're not gonna get a permit for moving uh, a rat. So any animals that, or any rodents that you catch in one of these live traps, you're going to need to immediately either release, in which case you shouldn't have put out the trap, um, or you're going to need to euthanize it humanely. Um, also be aware that depending upon what size trap you're using, you can also end up, you know, with a non-target within the trap that you then will need to release. And if it's, you know, a skunk, that may not be a very pleasant experience. Um, so again, be aware that, um, you know, this isn't an option to just be catching rats and taking them down the street. You would need to euthanize them. And if you have further questions on that, you can email me later and I can go over the different types um, of euthanasia that are legal in the state. Can I just jump in really quickly Absolutely. on that, Dr. Weitzel, sorry. Um, what we recommend at Wild Care with the catch and release traps is if you, if you catch a rat inside your home and then thoroughly seal all the ways that rats are getting into your home, you can then release the animal back outside. So if you, you can use these, you do have to release the animal again, but if you have made sure that the places where the animals were getting in or accessing things that you didn't want them to access, if you make sure those are no longer accessible, these do make a viable option, especially if you're removing an animal that's inside once you have eliminated the access inside. Hopefully that makes sense. Yes, it does just have to be released on your property. Correct, yes, yeah, relocation is illegal and actually for good reason. Uh, most of the animals that are relocated do die because they're getting plonked into someone else's territory where they don't know where the food and water and shelter and everything else are, so. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that, Allison. That is a good suggestion for getting them out of your house. All right. And of course, uh, please be safe. Rodents do carry a lot of diseases uh, that can be you know, transmitted to humans. So whenever you're disposing of dead rodents, you know, put them in plastic bags. Um, always wear gloves when handling traps, even if the trap is currently empty. I would recommend always wearing gloves um, when handling them. And so you can, with rodents, put them in a plastic bag and put them in the trash. Um, you do need to be aware uh, in the state of California, if you, you can't bury them within 150 feet of the water line. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. It may just be safest to put them in a plastic bag um, and put them into the trash. And of course, you know, wash your hands after handling any of these rodents. And lastly, just don't give up for your trapping program. Um, if you do decide to take a, a break, then don't store the traps with any strong smelling chemicals or pesticides and be ready to start again. Um, you know, these rodents, they're gonna be, they're gonna be coming back. Uh, so just keep that in mind and don't give up. You may just, you know, every year um, before your food is ripening, may need to start doing some trapping again to try to keep that uh, rodent population down and at, at a manageable level for your garden. And just, you know, what happens to your grass when you mow the lawn, you're going to have to mow it again. Um, and that is certainly true of rodent populations. Um, so make sure to check your traps. If you, you know, have all these set traps and there's zero bait in them, then change how you're putting bait out and rebate. Um, a trap with no bait is not going to catch anything. Uh, be patient. It can take a while. Um, be clever. You know, think through where where the rodents are moving. They love to often move along, you know, either uh, buildings or fence lines. Um, house mice do use corners, so placing a trap in a corner can be good. Um, just placing a trap randomly out in the open, very low odds. You're probably not going to catch anything there. Um, so just really try to think through where these rodents are moving. Um, I, yeah, I do just want to mention this, you know, people often ask what about repellents or ultrasonic devices. And I do have to say there's very little scientific evidence to support the success of many of those products. And so there are some resources online. Um, UC has, you know, especially our integrated pest management program has 
uh, particularly this newsletter. I can put this perhaps in the um, chat. Oh, it's not letting me put that in the chat. Um, if you want you know, more of these tips to read through it again, because uh, I know that was a lot of information that I went over today. But thanks so much. Um, please feel free to reach out with any questions you have. This is my email. Um, and not only about rodents, if you have any coyote concerns or mountain lions, um, California ground squirrels, happy to help you out. And with that, went a few minutes over, uh, but we wanted to jump into questions. So, you know, Allison will also be available for any questions you have for us. Um, thank you so much for listening today. Yeah, thank you both um, Dr. Weitzel and um, Ms. Hermans. And uh, we would love for you, we've already gotten a lot of questions in the chat. Um, so continue to put those in. And I've organized some of the ones that came in early that we can start with. And before I do that, let me just say thank you very much to our speakers and um, remind everyone that we will be sending a, a copy of this video as well as the resources mentioned. But before we start with questions, may I just ask everyone to take a moment to help all of our organizations and um, just take a quick moment to fill out a very short evaluation about the seminar today. It really helps all, all of our groups show um, the value of what we're doing. And I, I hope you found some value in everything we've covered. Um, Tracy's gonna put the link to the um, evaluation in the chat. And if you have a moment, it's very short, just take a second to do that as we're discussing questions. And with that, I'll turn to um, groups of questions we've already received. Um, and actually, I'll start with this, Dr. Weitzel, because I think you just um, covered part of this. Um, Mitchell was asking if repellents products like deer fence work, and someone else uh, was asking if peppermint oil spray is effective. So there hasn't been any research that's shown that it has. Um, so I, I can't speak, uh, I haven't you know, tested it myself, um, but as of now, there isn't any you know, research supporting um, its efficacy. Yeah, okay. If, um, I, if you wouldn't mind, can I jump in really quickly on that? Um, I, I agree, there's, not, there's no science out on it, but we have good anecdotal um, information that we get from stuff we recommend at Wild Care. Um, I saw one of the questions go by was about having rats in the car and one of the crawling under your hood or your car because they're drawn to, interestingly, the coating that the companies are putting on the wires in vehicles, especially in Priuses, apparently, is made from soybeans. So it's actually edible and uh, causes a lot of problems. And we have had good luck. I just texted one of my wildlife services representatives to ask what we're recommending for that right now. And she said the stinkiest dryer sheets you can find or the Irish spring soap, something just really stinky and chemically and renewing it on a regular basis. The peppermint oil can be kind of effective. I know for a couple of years we were recommending the cayenne spray actually on the wires under the car. Um, but those really st stinky, uh, not much really deters rats terribly effectively or, or permanently in that kind of in the scent situation, but you, um, you know, it's definitely going to be a way and, 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 you know, maybe you move where you park your car as well. So if you're parking your car in an area that has rodents running in, in ivy nearby, then use some stinky dryer sheets, change where you park your car and you're probably going to have less of a problem. Um, and then some of like the deer repellents and the rodent repellents. We always say try them. Um, I'm always kind of surprised. Like one of the things that works to get raccoon, or, or not raccoons, gophers uh, away is uh, put used cat litter in the holes. I'm always surprised when it works and it, there's no scientific evidence for it, but it does seem to be fairly effective. So there are some things out there that you can try that can be kind of low cost, but I wish there were more science on it for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and that's actually a good segue into uh, another group of questions about rat poisons or rodenticides. Um, Cindy was asking where anticoagulant poisons are coming from. And, and really the question is, can professionals still use them? She thought that they weren't available anymore. I think you might've covered this, but do you want to clarify? Well, Allison, do you want to Sure. Or? Yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. So it's interesting with, a, a, with the Wild Care's help and a lot of really amazing groups working together, there have been several laws passed in the last decade and a half 
uh, to reduce the availability of anticoagulant rodenticides to the general public. And as uh, interestingly, the, the thing that passed the most recently is a moratorium on the use of the anticoagulant rodenticides by both pest uh, controllers, pesticide people, and by the general public. You can't buy it in stores anymore. Pest control officers are not supposed to use it, except there's a really long list of exceptions to that rule. And, you know, health, and I, I don't even remember what all the exceptions were, but I was reading it and I was like, oh, so pretty much you can use them anytime. But that is only for pest control officers. In, um, I think, 2016, the law passed that they were no longer available to people uh, just going into the store and buying the poison. So that's really, really good. Um, they were still available. That might have been 2011. It all runs together. Uh, they were still available for people in large agricultural stores. So you could go in and buy like 9,000 pounds of it, but you couldn't buy, you know, the, the small thing to use for your yard. So slowly getting them away from the general public and sort of the everywhere, every backyard, every person use. Uh, as of this point, Again, the pest control operators are not supposed to be using it except in a, a wide number of, of, of exceptions that they have. So, um, and then just people saved it, right? When people, and you can get it on Amazon, like there's nothing to stop people from getting it, you know, out of state or going to Nevada and buying all the rat poison. So people still have access to it, but it is technically trying, it's supposed to be illegal. That, that is, yeah, that is why we're out here getting, um, getting, uh, all this information about other ways to do it. Um, we've got a, a bunch of questions about gardens. So let me just kind of group them uh, together. Um, one question is how much of an enclosure are you talking about with tomato plants, 18 inches or fully contained? Um, and uh, if there are any suggestions for a community garden that has rodents or rats. Right. Um, so when I'm talking about enclosure, I'm in talking fully enclosed. Um, so the entire plant being within, you know, quarter inch hardware, uh, hardware cloth. And so that can get tricky to build, right? And so honestly, for a community garden, that tends to be pretty big. I don't think that's going to be um, a practical solution. Um, you know, it will vary depending upon what plants you're growing. In my experience, the rats do not go after my peppers but they love the tomatoes. So it does depend what you're growing, how big of a problem um, rats can be. But that's why I mostly focus on trapping in my garden, um, just because it's not practical to be able to fully enclose the plants. Um, you do wanna keep in mind, uh, you know, <laughs> depending upon what material you're using, uh, you still want to allow pollinators in, so you don't want it to be completely, you know, plexiglass and never have it be open, um, you know, if the plants need pollination. But also, because rats are such great chewers, um, using things like, you know, bird netting kind of material, that's not really going to be helpful. They can easily chew through that. That's why you really need something that, you know, some hardware cloth, more like wire, or like a high enough gauge. Um, that the rodents aren't just going to be able to chew their way through. That I can speak from experience that that is that is true. <laughs> that hardware cloth it really works. Um, we do have a couple more questions back to the car engine um, challenges, um, and one was we, one was can you trap rats that are in the engine area, um, and the other is if like where exactly you would put the dryer sheets or smelly soap in the car. Austin, well, do you want to go for place? Sure, yeah, yeah, for place yeah, yeah, traps. I mean, you don't want to be driving around probably with a set trap. Mm -hmm. um, so depending upon how often you drive and so you don't forget to have a set trap, um, it would just depend upon the space and kind of logistically how it would fit. But for dryer sheets, I, I will uh, let Allison answer that one. Yeah, totally. So what we've had luck with is taking the dryer sheets or the soap and putting it in like a, a plastic bag or something with some holes punched in it so that it's easier to easy to put in and then remove and paying attention to where the rodents are. I mean, if they're just under your hood in general, you can put 
you know, a couple of bags of that, you know, the dryer sheets and the soap under the hood, just placing it in there in areas, obviously, where it's not going to melt and it's not going to be flammable and you can try that. Um, but I know a lot of people, when you have the rats that are kind of coming up underneath or they're getting in and then, you know, in various places, they will have those supplies that when they park, they put them in the various places where they have seen the rodents getting in and out. And then when they drive, of course, you take them out again. So that's, um, you know, probably the, it requires maintenance, but it, it is something that we have seen working. Yep, yep. And, and I would just add to what, um, what I think one of you mentioned, which is moving the car away from habitat that mm -hmm. is um, rat friendly. And that's what our neighbors also found <laughs> successful, um, mm -hmm. which is- Because they don't want to cross the open, right? right. They don't want to yeah. run across an open space because that sets them up for predators, especially if you have a mailbox, right? And so you're, you're yeah. setting them, you're, you're, you're setting yourself up for success by taking them away from that. Yeah. And, and that has also been a help with the county, which was also having problems. And they just cut back all the, the brush and habitat and that, that definitely allevi alleviated the problem. Um, let me turn us to another group of questions from um, our, our participants about traps and types of traps. Um, some questions we've already covered, um, the safest, best way to handle or dispose of dead rats, um, which if I remember is sealing it up completely in plastic and, and disposing it in the garbage. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the, there's an interesting question. Is it true that rats will be deterred by human scent on a trap? So should we be using gloves when setting traps? Right. So there hasn't been much evidence suggesting that actually. Um, I would just wear gloves for your own protection more than the scent aspect of it. Um, and also, well, I know people may not like to hear this, but actually the scent of um, previously caught rodents can actually be a bit of an attractant. Um, so people often ask me like, oh, will they smell you know, a carcass of a previous rat and will that then scare them off? And actually, no, it will make them more likely uh, to use that trap. So they almost become more effective over time. Great, great. Um, and we have a couple questions specifically about traps. First, we have some shout outs for traps that, um, you know, our listeners had found valuable. Bruce said he had good luck with the T-Rex and the rat sapper, which worked great at first, but not meant for outdoors. Um, but we do have a question about traps that capture live mice in a bucket of water. Um, and I think this is not related, but um, in an A24 trap, how does the rat get killed? Okay, so any sort of drowning trap is going to be illegal. Um, drowning is not an approved mode of euthanasia. And I know people often don't realize that. I get asked mm -hmm. about drowning, especially with the live traps quite frequently where people think, okay, if I catch a rat or a squirrel in a live trap, I can just drown it as a most means of euthanasia. And actually that is illegal. Um, you are not allowed to use drowning. It's not considered humane. Um, the A24 trap is a completely separate mechanism. So how it works is you have a gas cartridge attached to the trap itself. <laughs> it's hard without having it in front of me, but pretty much it's a, a cylinder that has at the top of it, the bait. So the rat to access the bait has to stick its head up the cylinder and it triggers the trigger point then causes um, a rod to come out, you know, really hard powered by the gas and it's blunt force trauma immediately kills the rodent. Um, and that's why then, you know, you weren't having to manually reset it. The rod automatically is reset. And if there's another rat, it'll get it again. Um, and so you're really, the only limiting factors there are like when the gas cartridge is emptied or when you need to replenish the bait. That's the only time that you need to, um, you know, do anything with the trap. It was actually developed in New Zealand. Uh, so that, that's how that one works. Can I jump in on something really quickly with that? I know you mentioned that one of the benefits of that particular trap is that you don't have to check it. And just from the wild here standpoint, I, I really want to have everyone be aware that if you're setting traps, we really, really, really want you to check them every single day because it is so incredibly common for non-target animals 
songbirds, all of so many different species to get caught and for animals of all species, including the rodents to get caught. Mm -hmm. and, and Dr. Whitesell talked about this quite a bit with those larger um, trigger mechanisms. I had not thought about that, but that's brilliant. It's true. Um, the animal not getting killed and in ending up in, a, in an incredibly painful and inhumane setting and situation because of that. And, and just the number of non-target animals. I saw a thing go by about opossums and just how incredibly often that does happen. So I really, really so strongly encourage everybody, if you are going to set a trap, you have to check it twice a day is what we recommend morning and night. And, um, but it's, uh, this, I mean, obviously, so this is a little bit of a different trap, but it's we we get so many animals coming in that are the unintended victims or the inappropriately trapped victims of of traps. So if you're going to do it, you have to be responsible about checking it yeah. all the time. Yeah, and and that actually brings us to a group of questions about about trapping um, and. Uh, uh, the one you were just mentioning, Allison, we were very sad to see a bunch of baby possums caught in the covered box traps. Anything that would deter the possum and still attract the rat? Unfortunately, no. no. Um, any, any of this food that we're using that rats are going to be interested in, other species are also probably going to be interested in. Um, and that's oh, sorry. reality. Um, I was just going to say that is another reason to think about sanitation and exclusion as the best possible options because you are going to be attracting other animals to the, the bait that you put into your traps. And so if you are removing what is attracting either the opossums or the rats, then you don't have, you don't have that situation. Yeah, and, and we had another um, participant, uh, Kathleen, who said that whenever we set any of the traps that were recommended, you mentioned, we tried Victor, the black, black snap traps, the rat zappers, all we caught were squirrels and birds while the rats continued to party in the vegetable garden all night long. Um, so the question was how to make the traps inaccessible to squirrels and birds. But I think um, we may wanna start with the answer is to try other things for trapping and uh, like and not to set them during the day. So if you're yes. talking songbirds, um, you know, or squirrels, even those are getting caught during the day. Mm. Um, so those traps are only going to be kept, you know, during the during daytime hours. They're only a potential threat. They're not going to be going after um, rats or mice. So yeah. if that's what you're catching, you know, I would definitely recommend not setting them during the day and just going to that extra effort um, of only setting them at night. Such a good point. The other thing that that I we we recommend at Wild Care is to pick up fallen fruit and fallen vegetable and fallen food matter in your garden and under your trees. Um, I you know a lot of people that have problems with the the rodents getting into their fruit trees. If you remove the fallen fruit from underneath the tree, it's less of an attractant. And I know that worked with our tomatoes one year when, it, when I'd have a few that fell, that's when all of a sudden the whole thing would be gone. But if I was careful about picking up the, the ones that had fallen, it was a little bit, it was a little bit more of a deterrent. Yep, yeah. Um, we, let's see, we have a, another question about um, uh, another sounds like inevitability if, if we're doing a lot of trapping, which is what, what is a humane way to kill a rat that's not quite dead in a trap? So I can only speak to what is considered legal forms of euthanasia, um, which is going to be for rodents, um, a carbon dioxide chamber, um, which you, you know, can either build or professional pest control companies um, typically have their own. Um, and I can, in the chat, even um, put in a website that goes over how to build that. Um, so that's unfortunate. I mean, the other one that is legal is cervical dislocation, but you would need to receive training on how to do that. And that is technical to do it accurately. Um, but that's where we just really want to be avoiding that situation in the first place. Well, and, and you can bring them to wild care. And what we, one of the things that we offer is humane euthanasia and that happens so often. And we do, you know, it's the most humane possible way. We put them under a, an anesthetic and then they're given an injection that stops the heart and it is 
absolutely painless and um, for so many people that that put out traps because they're not thinking of the consequences either you know to any of the animals and then they they see that injured animal and it's absolutely horrifying um, and so I'm, I'm very glad that wild care can provide that because it gives you an option if that happens and um, you know we're very lucky in California that we have a lot a number of wildlife care centers, Sonoma County Wildlife up in the North Bay, you have um, the Peninsula Humane Society has a wonderful wildlife hospital in the South Bay, you have Lindsay Wildlife over in the East Bay, although they do not take rats. Um, they don't take the non-native rats, so some of the hospitals don't take the all of the species, but wild care does. And we can absolutely provide that, that humane euthanasia in that situation. That's great. And you just covered another question that was asked about a resource down in the peninsula. So thank you. Um, we have a couple, just a few more questions left. Um, one is about voles. Um, voles, and Allison, I think you and I covered this on a TV show a long time ago. Um, voles are a huge issue in Marin County. Um, this, uh, this listener is using rat traps with boxes over the holes so that they don't trap or injure, injure any non-target animal, but do you have any other vole trapping or control suggestions? That could be another talk yeah. <laughs> um, in and of itself. So perhaps if you want to email me um, and I can go over some more of those um, options for you. Um, okay. But certainly with bulls, I mean, if you are wanting to do any sort of trapping, then making sure that those traps are not accessible above ground is going to be really important. So you're not catching anything else. And, you know, and same with gophers. You should never be seeing a gopher trap. That should never be above ground. That should be within the tunnel system. That makes sense. We would, for, from just from the wild care perspective on that, um, we always, you know, just make sure that you find out what is attracting them onto your property because voles are kind of everywhere and they're an amazing food source for so many so many other wild animals. And, um, you know, if you're like, well, they're going after my tomatoes, then I can see trapping being a very good op option in that situation, but finding out what they're going after. And if it is um, seed, if you have grasses that are going to seed, I think that's very often an attractant for voles and mowing that grass or getting rid of that seed and just making it so you have less of a food source available is going to keep those voles a little more in check. And right. I will quickly say, when you're starting to plant a garden, if you already have a well-established garden, a little too late for this, but if you are gonna be building a new one, especially any raised planter beds, I always recommend considering putting hardware cloth underneath where the plants will be. Um, just to preemptively protect those plants, you know, from yes. moles or from, you know, gopher is a big one, um, or even the tunnels of moles, even though the moles aren't going to be going after the plant itself, the tunnels can cause damage. Um, but that way you just don't have to be worrying about it and you aren't going to be, you know, needing to trap in the future. Um, of course, you can't do that for your entire backyard, but for any high value plants or for vegetables, um, I would very much consider that when you're starting to plant. And I would really have, you know, we have some, a lot of master gardeners I know are probably on this. And this is obviously we're with the master gardener program. And I think, um, you know, we're probably getting, I know nothing about gardening so much, but uh, we're probably getting to the point where you're planning your garden. And so that would absolutely be what Wildcare would say as well is, is, is do all of your research on the ways to make your garden as unattractive as possible to wildlife. And then you don't have to take these steps in order to prevent problems. Um, I just saw Kelly put up, think before you trap, always think before you trap. And I'd say, think before you plant too. Let's, let's do this in a way that is not going to cause these conflicts. Let's, let's take away what's attracting the, the, the rodents and then have fewer problems. Great. Um, and we just had a quick question about um, if, if, what type of rats dig tunnels. Um, somebody saw them running in and out of the holes. So Norway rats are going to be more often using tunnels um, or in burrow systems, but roof rats can also mm -hmm. use them. Um, so it can be either one of the rats. Uh, make sure it's rats and not California ground squirrels mm -hmm. also if you have a burrow system on your property. Um, those you know, as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. There are lots of things, unfortunately, <laughs> will use burrows. Um, but rats, typically Norway rats, but it, a burrow, 
burrow use in and of itself won't be able to tell you which species of rat you have. Got it. Got it. Okay. And the last question we have is um, just uh, what about rat X? Um, oh, I wanted to ask you about that, Dr. Whitesell. I was just looking it up. I'm not familiar with it. Yeah. Is I'm it not safe? either. I'll have to look that up too. Yeah, it says it's completely non toxic and it's like, seems like something you'd feed your, you know, feed your oh, children. But you I so I, I, I can, as a non-expert, I can speak a, a little bit to that and, and we'll include some, some follow-up in the resources, but um, I, I believe, yeah, it, it is, it doesn't have um, secondary impacts with other species, but um, it's uh, basically makes the rats incredibly thirsty and it sounds like a pretty uh, pretty brutal way, <laughs> yeah. pretty brutal way to go. So we'll, we'll include some information. I know that, um, County of Marin Parks, uh, had, had used that. So I will, um, get some information from Cat, um, Connect, who's the IPM specialist for in County Parks. Nice. Um, I also wanted to say just really quickly, I know people have, uh, are seeing yeah. the other poison options out there like bromethalin, and we are seeing um, a lot of non-target animals coming in with bromethalin coming in, poisoning coming into the wildlife hospital. And actually they were saying in the wildlife hospital just a couple of weeks ago that they are seeing bromethalin coming up the food chain. Um, and I don't have a lot of real information on that right now, but it's not like that's gonna be a safe poison. It's also a really, it's a neurotoxin. It's a really sort of horrible way to go as well. So, um, you know, really not thinking that, oh, we'll just use the other type of poisons and that's gonna be okay. Cause it, it, it isn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ex excellent question. Well. Um, we really appreciate um, the excellent information and resources you have shared with us, Dr. Wetzel and, um, and Ms. Hermance, and um, the collaboration that we've been able to do. And a big thank you to UC um, Master Gar Marine Master Gardeners for always hosting and, and editing and providing these um, videos afterwards that can be available on YouTube as well. And with that, I'll just ask if you haven't had a chance to quickly um, fill out our evaluation, we would appreciate it. And we um, great, we're very grateful for your um, for your time this evening, and look forward to um, hopefully seeing you again. We have one other upcoming seminar um, about um, your lawn and getting getting rid of your lawn on March fifth. So we'll we'll send a little bit of information in our follow up with that last seminar in our series. But thank you so much for joining us. And thank you very much, um, Allison and Carolyn, for your time tonight as well.